Unfortunately, resizing the window isn't quite as simple as setting the GLFW window hint resizable to true. If you have already tried doing so, you will have found out that when you try to make the window smaller or larger, the program will crash. This is because the LVE swap chain class encapsulates a Vulkan swap chain, frame buffers, and color and depth attachments. All of these objects have a fixed size once created equal to the size of the window. Therefore, whenever we observe that the window's size has changed, we will need to recreate a new swap chain using the updated dimensions. Additionally, if we construct a new swap chain, we might also have to build a new pipeline as the graphics pipeline currently relies on both the swap chain's width, height, and render pass. This is a dependency we can avoid most of the time by using a dynamic viewport and scissor. Finally, the command buffers are pretty dependent on the swap chain. We are still using a one-to-one -one relationship between command buffers and swap chain images, and when we record a command buffer, we use the swap chain's extent, render pass, and frame buffer. But it is pretty common to re-record the primary command buffers every frame, so this seems like a good a time as any to implement that as well. First, a thank you to the viewer who pointed this out. In the pipeline class, when deleting the copy operator, this shouldn't be void operator equals, but LVE pipeline reference operator equals. I've actually done this in the swap chain and device code as well, so make sure to update all occurrences of this mistake. Okay, first things first. Since our window will now be able to change dimensions, remove the const keyword from before the width and height variables. Next, add a new member variable, bool frame buffer resized. This will be used as a flag to signal that the window size has changed. Add a public function bool was window resized and return frame buffer resized. Next, add a void function reset window resized flag, which will set frame buffer resized to false. Finally, add a private static function called frame buffer resized callback that takes a glfw window pointer and an int width and int height. Now copy the callback function signature and open your window implementation file. Paste the function signature in and add your class name scope. Then within the function, create a local variable auto LVE window equal to reinterpret cast LVE window pointer glfw get window user pointer with the window pointer as the argument. Next, set LVE window arrow frame buffer resized to true, LVE window arrow width equal to width, and LVE window arrow height equal to height. And don't forget to remove the static keyword. Okay, now previously we've set the glfw window hint resizable to false. Change this to glfw underscore true. And then after we create the window called glfw set window user pointer with arguments window and this. Then call glfw set frame buffer size callback with arguments window and frame buffer resize callback. Essentially, the glfw library allows us to register a callback function that whenever the window is resized, the function will be called with the arguments being the window pointer and the window's new width and height. Additionally, the glfw set window user pointer function allows us to pair a glfw window object with an arbitrary pointer value, which in this case we set to be the parent LVE window object. Now in your first app header file, add two new private functions, void recreate swap chain and void record command buffer with a function parameter int image index. Then change the type of LVE swap chain to be a unique pointer and remove the initialization arguments. By using a unique pointer to our swap chain rather than a stack allocated variable, we can easily create a new swap chain with an updated width and height simply by constructing a new object. However, using pointers comes with a small performance cost. Now because LVE swap chain is a pointer, we need to use the arrow operator rather than the dot operator. So in your app implementation file, update each occurrence of this. Next, update the create command buffers function to only be responsible for command buffer allocation. So within this for loop, copy and delete this chunk of code where we record to the command buffers and remove the for loop. 
Then add a new function, void first app record command buffer with parameter int image index, and paste the chunk of code to record to the command buffer inside the function body. Then find and replace every occurrence of index i within the record command buffer function to use the image index value instead. Next, we need to implement the recreate swap chain function. So right here after the create pipeline, I'll add a new function void first app recreate swap chain. In the function body, I'll add a new local variable auto extent equal to LVE window dot get extent. So this just gets the current window size. Then in a loop, I'll check that while the extent dot width is equal to zero or extent dot height is equal to zero, I'll update my extent. So extent equals LVE window dot get extent and then call glfw wait events. So this is the effect that while the window has at least one dimension that is sizeless, the program will pause and wait. This can occur during minimization, for example. Then following the while loop, call VK device wait idle with arguments LVE device dot device. This is just an easy way that we can wait until the current swap chain is no longer being used before we create the new swap chain. Then after that, create the swap chain with LVE swap chain equal to std make unique angle brackets LVE swap chain with arguments LVE device and extent. As mentioned earlier, the pipeline also depends on the swap chain. So we need to call the create pipeline function following swap chain creation. In the first app constructor, we can then change the function call from create pipeline to recreate swap chain. Finally, navigate to the draw frame function. It is here where we can detect if the swap chain has been resized and decide whether or not it needs to be recreated. So under acquire next image at if result is equal to VK error out of date KHR, then recreate swap chain and return. This error can occur after the window has been resized. Then just before we submit our command buffers, we need to record them since we no longer do this at startup. So call record command buffer and pass in image index. Next, just underneath submit command buffers, add if result equals VK error out of date KHR or result equals VK sub optimal KHR or LVE window dot was resized. Then LVE window dot reset window resize flag, recreate swap chain and return. Make sure to save your code and then build and run. If you move your cursor to the corner of the window, you should now be able to resize the window to as small or as large as you want. Note that operating systems handle resizing differently. Mac OS actually does a great job. If you look at what it's doing, it pauses the program and takes the last rendered image, automatically scaling it to fill the current window as long as I have the window's corner selected. Once I release the corner, our program resumes and the triangle is re-rendered at the window's new resolution. But, for example, on Ubuntu resizing isn't nearly as smooth. This is partly due to the operating system, but also during resizing our program will probably block on the call to glfw poll events. To get around this, you need to come up with a solution that continues to draw frames while resizing is occurring. Okay, now a dynamic viewport incisor are pretty much the same as a regular viewport incisor, except that we specify them in a command buffer rather than at pipeline creation. So first navigate to your pipeline header file. Note that your pipeline config info struct may look slightly different to mine. Here's a bug fix that I posted only as a pinned comment on tutorial 5. Don't worry about going back to implement that if you haven't yet, since we will all get back onto the same page now. So first, make sure you've deleted the copy constructors. This will prevent my previous mistake of pointers to bad memory following a copy operation. Then remove the viewport and scissor fields. These are no longer needed when using a dynamic viewport and scissor. Next, make sure that your struct contains the viewport info field. Then we need to add two new fields. First, an std vector of VK dynamic state named dynamic state enables. Then a field of type VK pipeline dynamic state create info called dynamic state info. Okay, now scroll down to the default pipeline config info function. Update it so that it now reads static void default pipeline config info and takes a pipeline config info reference as the only parameter. Open your pipeline implementation file 
And let's start by updating the default pipeline config info function signature to match what we just defined in the header. Then make sure to remove the local config info variable if you have one declared. Next, remove the viewport and configuration code. Okay, now update the viewport info fields so that p viewports and p scissors are both now null pointers. Note that if you only implemented the first fix I showed in video 5, you'll want to move the viewport info configuration back down to here. Then at the end of the function, I'm going to configure the dynamic state enables and the dynamic state info fields. If you ever feel like avoiding some typing, in every tutorial so far, I've included in the description a git diff of the exact changes for the video, so you can copy and paste any large blocks of code. This code here just configures the pipeline to expect a dynamic viewport and dynamic scissor to be provided later. And finally, remove the return statement if you still have one here. Now scroll up to the create graphics pipeline function. If you have a local viewport info being created, you can get rid of that and update this line to use the config info.viewport info. And then everyone should update p dynamic state to point to config info.dynamic state info. Now in the first app implementation file, go to your create pipeline function, create a local pipeline config variable, and then initialize it with the updated default pipeline config info function. Removing the width and height arguments. Then in the record command buffer function, just after the begin render pass command, let's configure the dynamic viewport and scissor. This is another good opportunity to copy and paste from the change file. So we set up a viewport and scissor with the swap chain dimensions. And then we use vk command set viewport with the first argument as the command buffer at image index, followed with zero for the first viewport index, one for the viewport count, and a pointer to the local viewport object as the final argument. Similarly, for the scissor, we use vk command set scissor with identical arguments except for the final argument being a pointer to the scissor. So every frame now we record a command buffer and dynamically set the viewport just before submitting the buffer to be executed. This way we'll always be using the correct window size even if the swap chain changes. In the recreate swap chain function, we shouldn't yet remove the call to create a new pipeline, since technically the pipeline is still dependent on the swap chain's render pass. In tutorial 5, I said a render pass is kind of like a blueprint that tells the graphics pipeline what layout to expect for an output frame buffer, as well as some other info. However, even though the graphics pipeline was created with one render pass instance, the same pipeline can potentially work just fine with a new swap chain and a different render pass, so long as the render passes are compatible. I've included a link to the compatibility documentation in the description. So a future optimization will be to check if the render passes are compatible, and if so, then the pipeline doesn't need to be recreated. One last thing we should do when creating the new swap chain is to provide the previous swap chain if it exists. This can potentially result in better resizing behavior if any resources can be reused. And also, depending on the platform, helps with transitioning full screen permissions. Okay, so start by including memory in the LVE swap chain header. Next, copy and paste the constructor to add a second constructor. This constructor will have an additional parameter, std shared pointer, angle bracket LVE swap chain called previous. Then add a private function void init and add a new member variable std shared pointer LVE swap chain called old swap chain. Now in the swap chain implementation file, just under the constructor, add a new function void LVE swap chain init and copy and paste the contents of the swap chain constructor into the init function. Then replace the constructor contents with a call to init. Copy and paste the constructor and add a third parameter, shared pointer, LVE swap chain previous. And in the member initialization list, initialize old swap chain curly brace to previous. Now in the constructor body under the init function call, set old swap chain to a null pointer. We will use the old swap chain only during initialization, and then by setting it to null, signal that it is no longer needed and can be released from memory if nothing else is using it. Then, near the end of the create swap chain function, which should be around line 176, you can see here that we have a create info struct that is being used to configure a Vulkan object. 
Currently for the old swap chain field, we simply pass a null handle. Instead, let's update this to check that if the old swap chain member is a null pointer, then return the null handle. Otherwise, return old swap chain arrow swap chain. Navigate back to the recreate swap chain function, add an if statement to check if LVE swap chain is equal to a null pointer, then create our swap chain as we currently are doing. Else, the current swap chain is not null, so therefore create a new swap chain with the third argument being std move LVE swap chain. So if you're not familiar with move mechanics and smart pointers, I highly recommend taking a couple minutes after this video to read about them at Learn CPP. But essentially, you cannot copy a unique pointer. So what this move function does is it allows us to create a copy, but in doing so will automatically set LVE swap chain to be a null pointer so that memory management isn't broken. Then in your application header file, declare a new function just under create command buffers with void free command buffers. Then in the implementation file, I'll add void first app free command buffers. And in the body, I'll call vk free command buffers with lve device dot device, lve device dot get command pool, command buffers dot size, and command buffers dot data. And I'll cast size to a uint32 type with a static cast. Finally, call command buffers dot clear. Then inside the else block of the recreate swap chain function, let's check that if the new swap chain image count is not equal to command buffers dot size, then we'll want to free the command buffers and create new ones. One last addition I made was to add two assertions in the create pipeline function to check that the pipeline layout and the swap chain have both been initialized. Build and run your project to make sure everything is still working as before. In summary, we've set up a callback function that listens to changes on the GLFW window and updates the dimensions of the window wrapper class. The drawFrame function checks if the window has been resized every frame before drawing. Whenever it detects the swap chain is no longer valid, it recreates a new swap chain. We've changed to use a dynamic viewport so that the graphics pipeline is no longer dependent on the swap chain's dimensions. However, we still create a new pipeline every time because we are not sure if the old and new render passes are compatible yet. Thanks for watching. Cheers.